Hey gang, LinkedIn is number one in B2B display advertising in the U.S. And using LinkedIn advertising gives you a great advantage. You can stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. LinkedIn's targeting tools allow you to reach your precise audience down to their job title, company name, location, and more. That means your ads are being seen by those who matter. Scale your marketing, grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. As a thank you to their customers for helping them grow three times faster than the competition and just for listening to Winfluence, LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence just for you to claim that credit. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. A hundred bucks in free ads? I'm down. Folks, being a guest on a podcast is perhaps the most effective way to build your own credibility and authority on what you know or what your company does. You can get booked as a guest on lots of podcasts, and Outlier Audio is great at helping you do just that. Outlier Audio focuses on getting entrepreneurs, investors, and business professionals booked on podcasts. Tell your brand story without the need to interrupt an audience with an ad. Be the reason they listen to the podcast. Get started with a five-podcast booking trial to see if you like it. Find out more at outlieraudio.com slash bookme. That's outlieraudio.com slash bookme. On this episode of Winfluence. I'm not saying I don't believe in payment. I'm an influencer as well. I get paid to do some of this stuff. But I always start with a free invite. Hey, would you like to come by? You know, if you can, here's what we'll do, blah, blah. And if they say no... Okay. And if they say yes, I say pick any time. We'll take really good care of you. My team knows exactly what to do when influencers walk through the door. Like we built a system for it. And you know what? The influencers can choose not to do that. So you people who are, you have to pay influencers to calm down. I do advocate for paying influencers, but if they're happy to do it without compensation, then hey, God bless. Yeah. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls. And in this podcast, We explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. It's no question the pandemic had and is still having a tremendous impact on the restaurant industry. In fact, as today's guest points out, when you look at the history of how and why people use restaurants, the experience has changed. Rev Ciancio is a food and hospitality industry influencer. Yep, in the B2B space. He speaks at food and beverage industry conferences. He is a marketing and tech evangelist for the food business. He's often engaged to consult with restaurants on developing their tech stack and customer acquisition approach. But Rev is also quite the B2C influencer as well. He runs the channel Fun With Fries on Instagram. It has 334,000 followers for what is essentially French fry porn. Pictures of orders of French fries, mostly user-generated content that he repurposes. Seems frivolous and silly, right? Well, he has a long-standing relationship with a French fry wholesaler because of that account. So there. His industry credentials give him the true influence in a specific niche. His flair for creating engaging content gives him the consumer following too. So Rev has the best of both worlds as an influencer and content creator and someone who is also influential. I caught up with him recently to talk about the food industry and its post-pandemic challenges, how he manages influencer marketing for his own local restaurant, What technology and marketing channels and approaches are smart for restaurants to acquire customers and beyond? He gives some great insight for both brands and influencers in the first part of the conversation about how to divide your content smartly around various networks. So pay close attention on the advice here, folks. More insights from Rev Ciancio today on Winfluence. Before we get to all those great insights from Rev, I want to touch on two fantastic supporters of Winfluence today. You've heard me talk about Tagger quite a bit on this show. That's because they are our presenting sponsor. Tagger is a complete influencer marketing software solution. With it, you can find, prioritize, connect, and collaborate with, measure, and even pay the content creators you use for your influencer programs. Now, I could go on, but you know I use it. You know I like it. You should check it out too. It might be right for your brand or agency. Go to jason.online slash tagger to get a free demo and see if tagger is right for you. That's jason.online slash tagger. 
And you may have heard me talking about LinkedIn before the show or maybe during the breaks lately. That's because LinkedIn has partnered with me to offer you a $100 advertising credit to get your message in front of the right kind of decision makers. I use LinkedIn advertising to target leads based on job descriptions, companies, seniority, industry, and more. What that means is I'm not wasting advertising spend getting my message in front of a lot of people who aren't my ideal customer. You can too. LinkedIn is offering you, listeners of Winfluence, you get a $100 ad credit just for listening to the show. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence today. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. 100 bucks in free ad credits. Yes, please. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. The Fry Guy who has both influence and is an influencer. Rev Ciancio is next on Winfluence. This episode is brought to you by Boar's Head. If you're looking for something delicious, look no further than Boar's Head Pit Craft Turkey. It's slow roasted with real mesquite wood chips to give it a real pit smoke flavor. And its authentic dry rub made of paprika, brown sugar, and Mexican chilies gives it a bold taste you need to experience yourself. Boar's Head. Compromise elsewhere. Find Pit Craft Turkey at your local Boar's Head retailer. Rev, there's so much I want to ask you, but let's start with the head scratcher. How in the world are there 335,000 people who want to see French fry porn on their Instagram feed? <laughs> you know, that that account, Fun With Fries on Instagram, started as a complete joke. At the time, I was working for a, a company that made hamburger meat for restaurants, and I was trying to think, like, how can we provide extra value to our, our you know clients that were buying hamburgers from us? I said, well, if I can build up a big, you know, Instagram community of French fry lovers, like I can help promote these other restaurants. Well, I don't work for that uh, company anymore, but that account kind of blew up and it turns out, guess what? People like fries. So, (laughs) well, I mean, you and I, if you're not the the cheeseburger and fries guy, I am. You and I are brothers from a different mother. So I appreciate it. I just can't imagine there's that many people out there who want to see constant pictures of french fries but i guess there are so there, there are i there it used to be 343,000 followers so i think instagram has scraped a few bots up there but still like people want to look at french fries that's what that account is for <laughs> that's good stuff well i mean I, I'm, I'm curious on that uh, fun with fries account for those of you who didn't catch that it's at fun with fries on instagram um how much of that content is curated from other users versus your content and how often do you get approached for like sponsored content and collaborations on a channel like that that's a great question. So I would say, you know, 98, 99% of it is curation. And that's why it even says in the bio curated by Rev Ciancio, because I'm not trying to take credit for those photos. I want to give credit to the original content creator. Uh, but the, the, the one or 2% that's original is me literally just curating from my Rev Ciancio account. So I guess in a sense, it's all curated. Okay. Uh, but for the most, for the most part, it's a, it's a curated account. Um, how often do I get approached? Well, it's funny, um, less frequently than you would think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How, however, I am an ambassador for a company called Lamb Weston. I don't know if you know Lamb Weston, but they're the world's leading French fry manufacturer. Hmm. So that account landed that relationship, and I've been doing that with them for four or five years now. So I get basically paid to talk about French fries. <laughs> That's great. So it's not that you're you're getting paid to talk about French fries on Instagram, though. You're getting paid by them to talk about French fries elsewhere, or am I wrong there? Uh, I mean, most of the activations that we collaborate on together are based on content that goes to Instagram and or TikTok. Okay. Uh, but you know, I've spoke, I've done public speaking, I've hosted webinars for them. You know, I've flown out and speaking to their employees. But you know, I'm I'm an advocate for for French fries at food service, particularly not necessarily. You know, French fries that you're cooking at home, but French mm-hmm. fries in restaurants. Very nice. Okay. Very good. And they're, and they're a fantastic company, and I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of that relationship. So I've, 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 I've flown to their manufacturing plant several times. I've seen the care <laughs> that they put into the fields. Like, they truly love potatoes. That's the, well, that's good. And it's good to know that too. And I'm glad they've got someone like you out there advocating for them. I want to, I want to get a little bit deeper into those sort of B2B relationships in a minute, but let me, let me kind of wind there a, a little slowly. So for those who don't know, just to kind of establish, reestablish or establish the fact you aren't just some schlep who posts a lot of people's pictures on French fries. You are known as a restaurant and hospitality marketing expert. I know you speak at all the big restaurant shows, 
You're also a B2B tech influencer. How do those two very different spheres, restaurant, foodie stuff, and B2B tech, how do those different spheres of influence come together? How'd you get to be that way? I don't know how I would. I think I just grew up loving restaurants <laughs> and marketing, but uh, you know, in, in, in 2016, you know, I was an agency owner in the music business. And at the same time, me and a couple of buddies bought a bar in New York city. And so it was like school of hard knocks, like learning how to run a, a hospitality based business. But I come from a marketing and agency background. Like that's my background. Um, and a couple of years into buying the bar, I decided I didn't want to be in the music business anymore. And I wanted to go full into like hospitality and service uh, we ended up losing that bar. It's a very long story. We were very terrible operators. But what I learned is that, you know, as we lost that bar, like, we, you know, actually, I still owe money on that. I was still still in debt from that bar, you know, six years later. Uh, but people would call me and be like, how did you guys go out of business? You know, you had thousands of followers on social media and you had a 4.5 on Yelp and you had 15,000 people on your, you know, email database. And I mean, this is, you know, six, seven years ago. And literally I was like, oh, I'm really good at marketing a restaurant at the location based level. Like that's actually my, my skill set. And at that point in time, I was like, okay, I'm going to dedicate myself to helping restaurants do something they're not so great at, which is marketing. And, you know, long story short, like that, that was the beginning of the path. And so I, you know, I've worked for some manufacturers, I work for some hospitality marketing companies, uh, but all in, in service of helping restaurants to basically attract and retain more guests. So is the B2B tech piece of it more fed by the restaurant industry specific businesses, if you will? Yeah. So, you know, like at the time when I was running, you know, when we were on that bar was called Idle Hands. It was in the East Village. We had zero tech. We didn't even have a point of sale system. Like we had a cash register and a card swipe. Like (laughs) and, you know, and I had Facebook, Instagram and Excel spreadsheets like that was it. And the fact that we were able to be so good at marketing with zero tools, right, was kind of amazing. But then I started to realize as I got deeper in the industry that like, oh, my God, there's all these incredible tools that make all that work that we had to do so much easier, like tools that help you manage Google and Yelp and Bing or customers that help you analyze your database or, you know, tools that help you build Facebook and Instagram ads or tools that help you get guest feedback. And I was just fascinated by all these tools that like, wow, what a difference this would have made in the business if we had them. I started working for those companies Right. I work for a company called Yext and I work for a company called Single Platform. I just became like a tech evangelist because I was like, oh, my God, these tools make the job so much easier. These tools help the business go faster. And if if, if something helps you go faster uh, and makes it easier and helps you make more money, I'm a fan of that combination. You know what I mean? And so what happened over time is just like I became the tech evangelist for restaurants. Yeah. So when I'm looking at your content and I think when most consumers like go look at your content and I'm not specifically talking about the, you know, the fun with fries, I'm talking about you, the, the rev channels. Um, a lot of people might look at that and say, Oh, this is a foodie. This guy's a foodie. And he, you know, posts about food and restaurants and reviews food and such. I do, but, (laughs) and, and you do, but I wonder, is your goal more for consumers to follow you or to have more restaurant owner and restaurant industry people follow you? Cause that's your core business. Sure. So I used to sort of split it up on every channel, right? So it was like 75% go eat. I called it content that was about go eat here, right? Like, (laughs) you know, here's a great restaurant and 25% like hospitality marketing tips. Uh, In the last, I don't know, three or six months, I kind of shifted a little bit. And so now I'm leaning into like what I think performs well on that channel. So on Instagram, I found out that hospitality marketing tips don't perform as well as I want them to. Right. Mainly because the operator or the marketer isn't on that channel trying to learn. Right. So I was like, okay, well, if I can show you an example of how you can be good at using this channel for what it's used for, then I'll track that. Like, hey, he's really good at social media. You know what I mean? And then I also have my own restaurant in New York City. And so, like, you can watch what I'm doing with my restaurant account and see that I know how to implement the system. Right. So I kind of let it speak for itself. And so I've reduced it down to about 10 percent restaurant marketing content on Instagram versus LinkedIn, which is very B2B. And I made that that's 90 percent hospitality, marketing, technology, evangelism, blah, blah, blah. And then 10 percent like here's my new Hawaiian shirt. (laughs) but in in, any anyway basically rather than just like taking a blast approach to i want to be 75 percent go eat here and 25 percent hospitality marketing content 
I've reconfigured the way I do things based on what I think works on that network. You know what I mean? Well, and that's just, that's really sound advice, especially for those content creators and influencers out there listening, because a lot of them, I think, take that, especially if they're more, you know, focused on driving consumer followers or, or engagement, they really focus on, okay, if I'm, let's say I'm a fashion influencer, I'm just going to be a fashion influencer everywhere, but you can make a lot more money as a fashion influencer. If you have content, that's also tied to the fashion industry. And that's not necessarily Instagram posts to your point. It's kind of like, well, LinkedIn is a different place. And I think there's a lot of creators out there and a lot of brands out there that don't look at each channel as a different pathway to different audiences. That's pretty no, smart. They're just, they're just batching and blasting. Here's the content I want to push. I'm pushing, pushing it on all channels. You know what I mean? And, you know, listen, that's probably, you know, if you do that, if you make one piece of content, push it out everywhere uh, on a B2B universe, you're probably actually doing better than 60 or 70% of the other people on those social networks. However, it's not optimal. You know what I mean? Make the content that works for that channel or even more importantly, make the content that's uh, for the people that are on that channel and why they're there. You know what I mean? Beautiful. Now you're talking my language. I love it. <laughs> All right. Which so is hard. I make it sound easy. It's not easy. It's hard. It takes time. You know what I mean? You got to, you, you know, you got to dedicate yourself to it. You're absolutely right. And I, I actually had a, a consulting call yesterday with a, a nonprofit that just called and asked if they could pick my brain. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And the focus of the conversation really was on, um, you know, trying to teach them that, you know, your e the content that you put out on email is different than the content you put out on social media is different than the content you put in direct mail because each of those mechanisms are a different and B for a different audience. And they never saw their audience as different. They were like, well, we're going to pay, put this stuff on social and then we'll copy and paste it into an email and then we'll copy and paste it into a newsletter or something we mail out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you, your people who follow a nonprofit on social are generally people who are already donating, already giving, already involved. The people who are, um, you know, you're emailing are the people who are already engaged, already involved. But your direct mail piece is probably going to be people that you're trying to solicit, people that you're trying to get involved. And so those are two very different things. So it's the same kind of yeah. Mentality. I tell I, I, I tell restaurants a very similar story because you go look at their content on like Instagram for say, and it looks like they're posting content that's attempting to attract new guests. And then I always say to them, I go, who follows a restaurant on Instagram if they haven't already eaten there or intend to? Your <laughs> followers are your guests. Yes. Instagram is a retention channel, not an acquisition channel. Yes. And when you start to think about that it, and you reframe the content you're putting on Instagram, knowing these people already know and like you, mm -hmm. you, fr you start to create content in a different way for that channel. Well, and you touched on something really important, especially for the restaurant industry. If you think social media is the way to market and you're really focusing all your energies on social media channels, you're talking in circles to people who already know you. You're not acquiring customers, which is a very different thing. Folks, after the break, Rev Ciancio tells us more about the state of the restaurant industry post pandemic and how he recommends restaurants address that issue of customer acquisition. Stay tuned. This year's NBA playoffs are going to feature a lot of great rookies. And FanDuel wants you to be one of them. Make your debut on FanDuel Sportsbook with promo code ROOKIE. And your first bet is risk-free up to 1000 bucks. So you can bet the point spread, grab the money line, or build a same-game parlay. And if you make a rookie mistake, FanDuel will give you up to $1,000 back in site credit. So you can take another shot. Okay, this guy's got potential. Make every moment more with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up and unlock your risk-free first bet up to $1,000. We're looking forward to seeing what you're made of. 21 plus in President Virginia. First online real money wager only. Refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. The real, the real meat of this conversation, uh, pun firmly intended, um, <laughs> is, is talking about restaurant marketing and how influencers layer into that. I want to start with the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and I'm not talking about myself. What, what kind of real lasting impact is the pandemic having on the restaurant and hospitality industry? A lot of restaurants closed. Many of them aren't coming back. What are the industry people saying and thinking about where COVID took them? And is it a thought process of, it's over. We can get back to business. Or is there more of a sense of we've got to climb ahead of us here? 
Sure. I think if you ask 10 people, you'll probably get eight or 10 different answers to that question. Um, but I think they're all going to lead back to something very similar, which is, you know, the, the hospitality industry is becoming tech focused. You know what I mean? And I don't know that the pandemic really changed anything for restaurants. I think it just sped it up. Uh, I think this was coming either way. And, you know, you look at like the tech revolution that like hotels went through like 20 years ago, online booking and, you know, the aggregators and, you know, all these other, you know, being able to order from your room and all that kind of stuff. Like they were just what they were doing is they were meeting the guests where they are, which was their mobile phone. Right. And so restaurants now are like, oh, oh, you have a phone in your hand. Can I meet you there? <laughs> so I, I think, you know, the biggest change in the, and the shift from 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 the pandemic is really getting restaurants to be technology focused. And also like the next step that is then to become like data obsessed, right? So no decision should be made at a restaurant, regardless of your size, you're an independent operator or an enterprise chain without some level of data analyzation. What does my data tell me? And what hunch, you know, how can I mix that with a hunch about my experience that tells me what to do next? Right. And I think, and this is the biggest shift. Okay. This is really the biggest in that this is the biggest piece of it. The hospitality business since its inception, since the first restaurant in the caveman days, I'm making this up, uh, was about people walking to a place or walking into a place and being served, right? Whether it's being served a bag to take out or being served at a table, right? And so the entire process happened around a transaction where you give me food, I give you payment, Right. And so what is the one piece of technology that every restaurant believes they need a point of sale system because we have to collect the payment? Well, now we're in a universe where I can in, I can intersect with your brand, your restaurant brand on Google, or I can read a review on Yelp or I can see you on Instagram or I need your address when I call a car or I'm, you can send ads to me or I can leave you a review like there are so many touch points. I can join your email list. I can download your app. You can text me. There are so many ways that I can interact with your brand. It's not just about the transaction anymore. And where I think we're heading and what I'm imploring restaurant brands to be thinking about is what's more important in my tech stack, my CRM, my customer relationship management tool, or my point of sale system. What's what's most important to me, the transaction or helping the guest on their journey? Either decision is fine. Pick one. And then build your stack around that. And where, you know, where I believe the future is, is building around the customer journey. And then the transaction is just a part of that. Very, very nice. All right. So now let's circle back to the whole customer acquisition problem, sure. uh, because that's kind of what we're talking about here. We talked about how in, in Instagram and social media, you're talking to your current customers, not a great you know, customer acquisition channel. What are the recommendations you give to restaurants about customer acquisition? What tools do you leverage? What tech stack elements are you employing to grow that audience so that you can talk to more people on social and have more repeat customers? Sure. So I'm a I'm a digital marketer at heart, right? So I, we're gonna leave we're gonna leave uh, IRL marketing out of the conversation, billboards and direct mail, whatever they work. But he, I believe that there are four main channels for acquisition for a restaurant. Okay, four. Okay, these are in no order other than which they're popping into my head. N number one, third party delivery, right? So Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, right? That is that is an actual way to acquire new guests. If you're a fine dining restaurant, it's something like Open Table. Either way, they're marketplaces. Okay, now I don't love those channels because they have a tendency to keep the guest information. They're really just renting space in your kitchen by having you fulfill an order, right? So I'm okay with third party if and only if a restaurant prioritizes what I call conversion. How do I get a guest to, to switch over to ordering from me directly or make a direct reservation? So third party is number one, or marketplace. Number two is, is local search. So when I'm craving pizza, what do I do? I go to Google or I go to Yelp or TripAdvisor and I go best pizza near me, right? So you have to be optimized for local search. And that is actually a way bigger slice of acquisition that restaurants give it credit for. And I'm not talking about buying ads on Google. I'm talking about optimizing for Google local search. Okay, that's number two. Number three is word of mouth, right? And what does word of mouth look like in, in 2022 and beyond? It's getting your guests who've had a great experience to leave a review on Google, Yelp, or TripAdvisor and you responding to that review so other guests see it, right? And it's getting your guests to share content on social media about your, your brand that you then like, comment, and share, right? That's word of mouth. So we got third party or marketplace, right? Local search. We got word of mouth. What's number four? It's social ads, 
right? It's using, it's using Facebook and Instagram ads. Now I'm not talking about boosting a post. I'm literally talking about going into business manager and creating ads. Cause here's the thing. The number two most popular type of content on social media is food. Number one, by the way, is fashion. Uh, Number two, which means that when people are on Instagram and when people are on Facebook, they are used to seeing pictures of your lunch, right? So it's way less of a di- of a disruption to send them an ad for your restaurant, right? Because they're used to looking at pictures of food. And so it's a really low and easy way in the funnel to get people to find out about your business. Those are the top four ways. So where in those four ways, and I can, I can see ways because I do, you know, I do this for a living. I can see ways how this intertwines, but I'd love to get your answer to the question. Where in those four ways, or is it externally as well? Where do influencers fold into that? What do you tell restaurant owners about influencers? Assuming you don't just say that they go to them and say, please let me sponsor your Instagram. account." <laughs> so I do, I am a fan of influencer marketing. It's just way harder to do than the other things, right? Mm-hmm. You know, in New York City, where my restaurant is and where I'm located, there's a billion influencers and they're a little bit of like a white noise. Like there's so many that it doesn't quite have the impact. Or you could be in a tiny little town where there's like an influencer. Right. So I don't generally go like, hey, you have to make sure influencers are part of your marketing. However, that being said, it's a really incredible way to drive top of funnel awareness. I do not think it's a great way for bottom of funnel. Nobody sees, nobody's following an influencer that they think knows where the best pizza is in their town, sees the Instagram post and is five minutes later placing an order, right? Influencer marketing is a great way to get top of funnel awareness. It's like taking Facebook ads, right? And local search and adding it together, right? If you trust that I know where good places to eat are, right? You'll follow me and then I'll let you know about a place, okay? But here's the mistake a lot of restaurants make. Actually, even not even just restaurants, businesses, they think that there's like a golden influencer. Oh, if I get so and so to post about my business, I'll never have to advertise again. I'm being a little dramatic there, but it's true, right? There's only one Kim Kardashian and she's not coming to eat at your taco shop. Okay, (laughs) get over it. (laughs) And so what you really need is if you're going to implore influencer marketing as a as a method of raising awareness for your business, it has to be consistent and it has to be constant, right? My restaurant, we've been open since November. It's We're, we're here talking at the end of April. Mm-hmm. We've been open for four months. We've invited 75 different influencers into the business. 39 of them have stopped by and taken a picture and shared it to their social media. It is just part of our awareness program. We have to manage it as a channel. That's the way to do it, Right. That's fantastic. And, and for that, and, uh, you know, obviously that's a, a local restaurant, I, I think a single location, right? That's correct. And, and, and so you've, you've, you've invited 70 some odd people and 30 some odd have come by. Are these just people you've invited to have a free meal or are you paying them? How's that working? Uh, I'm not saying I don't believe in payment, right? I'm an influencer as well. I get paid to do some of this stuff. Uh, but I always start with a free invite. Hey, would Mm -hmm. you like to come by? You know, if you can, here's what we'll do, blah, blah. And if they say no, okay. Yeah. You know, and if they say yes, I say pick any time. We'll take really good care of you. My team knows exactly what to do when influencers walk through the door. Like we built a system for it. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to say this is a point of bragging, but like we've yet to pay an influencer, right? (laughs) We, We just treat them very hospitable. We offer them a VIP experience. They get to come and have the food. People tell us our food's awesome. They usually come have a great time. It's good enough. Yep. And you know what? The influencers can choose not to do that. So you people who are, you have to pay influencers to calm down because the influencer, the creator gets to choose that if they want, that's fine. All right. So I do do advocate for paying influencers, but if they're happy to do it without compensation, then Hey, God bless. Yeah, there you go. And, and if they come back to you with, well, you have to pay me, then you have the opportunity as a business owner to kind of look at them and look at the cost benefit analysis and say, yeah, you're probably worth an investment or no, you're not. And you can make that call. That's okay. Yeah. Listen, I've made influencers very happy for 50 bucks. (laughs) That's true, man. If you put good food in my belly, it doesn't matter what my rates are, man. I'm, I'm probably pretty happy. Yeah. And speaking, Um, speaking as an influencer real quick, like, look, the content monster is always hungry. Right. So I need content. So if you say, hey, come to my restaurant and I was going to go anyway, or I think the place looks good. And then you give me 50 bucks like, heck, yeah, man, that's awesome. You know, that's a good deal. All right. Let let me ask you to put yourself uh, into that 
restaurant owner mindset. Maybe not you specifically, because you you kind of you're kind of inside baseball on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but let me ask you to put yourself in the mind of a typical restaurant owner. I'm a food influencer, or maybe a local shopping influencer, very similar. What pitch from me, the influencer, to you, the typical restaurant owner, is going to convince you that I'm a worthwhile investment to? pay or, you know, comp a meal to, what do I need to bring to the table to make you want to collaborate with me? Um, how about a very friendly intro and don't use the word collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. The word collaboration is an allergic thing now, huh? Yeah. Whenever I get a DM from an influencer at the restaurant, that's like, Hey, can we collab? Like I hate that word because, <laughs> yeah. because nobody, it's not that it's a bad word. It's an, it's an amazing word, but nobody agrees on the definition. Right. right? And collaboration to me usually means I'm using a word that makes you think I'm going to pay you, but I'm not. Right. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, but no, I think a friendly intro, like, Hey, I saw your restaurant on Instagram. It looks delicious. You know, we do this in exchange for X and Y, you know, would it make sense for us to come by? Like, just be a person, just be, yeah. be friendly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, let's flip that. What do influencers do wrong or poorly outside of using the word collab in positioning themselves to help restaurants flourish? Uh, man, there's so many things, but this is the one I don't understand. So I've been, you know, air quotes here, an influencer since before Instagram. You know, I started writing a hamburger blog in 2008. Like I've done this forever. And all of a sudden, like you see these accounts now that have like four or 5,000 accounts and like kudos to you for building four or 5,000 followers. That's impressive. Right. But I, you know, I'll invite them to my restaurant and be like, Hey, you know, would you like to come in? You know, we'd be happy to take care of you. I'm like, cool. Can I bring three of my friends? Mm. And I'm like, uh, you know, I didn't offer to cater your birthday. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, it, and, and it, you know, I don't want to act, I don't want to come off like, who are you to ask? Like, you know, my mom taught me growing up, don't ask, don't get but it seems crazy to me that it'd be like, you know, I have a small audience, but can you make sure all of my friends and I have a great time one night? I was like, okay, I guess maybe, but that seems a little crazy to me. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think the other thing too is like, li- the other thing is seems crazy is like literally asking for money out of the gate. Like, you know what, build a relationship. You know, if you had a job in sales and you were selling software or houses or fencing or whatever, or sod, I don't care. You don't just walk up to people in the street and be like, do you want to buy my sod? <laughs> build a relationship you know if you want that restaurant to pay you like build like say something nice build a relationship don't ask for money on the first date i almost automatically delete the pit the pitch for money every yeah. time yeah they come out of the gate like hey restaurants pay us 500 dollars and yada 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 like well i appreciate appreciate how direct you are but like no i don't even know who you are that's that's good advice for folks. You know, one conflict I wanted to touch on with you, and, and you, you 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 sort of steered that way a minute ago, and I probably should have asked the question then, but one conflict that I see that might arise in the whole influencer piece for restaurants is, you know, kind of a problem that I kind of put in the bucket of efficiency of the influencer audience. And, and here's what I mean. So in Louisville, Kentucky, where I live, um, and, and, you know, we've got, you know, a, a number of influencers, we've got a pretty healthy, you know, influencer marketing market, if you will here. Um, we've got Damaris Phillips, who is a chef, a television host. Uh, she's written some books. Um, she actually is an influencer, uh, partner for one of the clients that I work with on some, you know, sort of smaller level influencer. She's more of kind of the, the mega celebrity influencer. She's got, you know, all together with, you know, Facebook and all that, about a million followers. God bless. Um, but, and so she's done a fantastic job and she's absolutely, uh, you know, wonderful as a content creator. But if I'm a restaurant in Louisville, Kentucky, and I cherish this, you know, if Damaris Phillips comes to my restaurant and says nice things on social media, I never have to you know, worry about marketing <laughs> again. If I'm one of those people, like you were t- describing, 4% of her audience which 4% of a million people is still a lot of people, people but, yeah. but 4% of our audience is in Louisville, Kentucky. So for someone that, and that, that efficiency problem um, is a problem, I think, because a lot of local restaurants think, Ooh, Damaris Phillips has a lot of followers, but they never understand how many of those followers are actually in your footprint that are actually target consumers for you. And I think that's a big problem. We've got a similar one in town, um, uh, you know, Chris, the barbecue Buddha, uh, is uh, a grilling guy and it's the same thing. If you look at his audience, 
uh, and see where he is. He, I think he recently moved away from Louisville, but he's got like 2% of his audience, got a, a couple hundred thousand followers, but only 2% are here. So I wonder if that's, you know, part of what you were you were speaking to earlier about the problem of that golden, you know, calf influencer that you want to go after. A lot of these restaurant owners don't even realize their audience may not be relevant to you at all, even if they live right down the street. No, nope. you got to do the research. And, and and I'll say this, you know, going up 10,000 feet, like there's no silver bullet in restaurant marketing. There isn't, right? It's about incrementality. Do this a little better, do this a little better, do that a little better, do this other thing a little better. And all that adds up over time. Well, Rev, this has been fantastic for, obviously, for the, the food industry and the restaurant people that might be listening, but I think also for the, the agencies and the content creators that are out there listening as well. Appreciate your expertise today. Where can people find you online if they want to connect and learn more? Awesome. Well, I, listen, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm at Rev Ciancio on every platform. I'm also fun with fries, but uh, most people are like, I don't know how to spell Rev Ciancio. It's R-E-V-C-I-A-N-C-I-O. And if you're like, I still can't spell that, go to fun with fries on Instagram and you can click Rev Ciancio in the bio and go right <laughs> over to my Instagram account. So see you use your experience. He's got his touch points nailed down folks. Rev man. Thanks for the time today. Appreciate your uh, expertise. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I am hungry. Great tips and ideas for restaurants and influencers alike there from Rev Ciancio. You can find him online at Rev Ciancio. That's R-E-V-C-I-A-N-C-I-O. Rev Ciancio. And also at Fun With Fries on Instagram. That's a little easier to remember and spell. Go connect, especially if you're in the restaurant or hospitality business. Folks, don't forget to drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We're on them all, I think. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Podchaser, TuneIt, Podbean. Wait, are, are we on Podbean? I think, I think we're on Podbean. Anyway, let's put it this way. If you're listening to us right now, look for the stars or ratings on that app and tap or click and let us know how we're doing. We would greatly appreciate that. Also, if you'd like a deep dive on influencer marketing topics every so often, subscribe to my email newsletter at jason.online slash subscribe. Go there now, drop in your name and email address. That way you'll get that newsletter. I send it every four to six weeks. I go deep on a topic to make your influence marketing smarter. I got my notification today to write a new one. So hopefully the next issue will come out very soon. Yes, I have to send a cal- uh, do a calendar thing to remind me to write it. It's just I get carried away with other things. Anyway. So a new one should be coming out very soon. Jason.online slash subscribe. Get on that list. And I'd love for you to help me make a future episode of Winfluence Awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send me an email to jason at jasonfalls.com if you're feeling adventurous. Record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show in your own voice. Regardless of how you ask it, however, I may use your comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. I'm Ian Truscott here to tell you about Rockstar CMO FM. The M is for marketing and the F is for well you decide. As you wonder, does the world need another effing marketing podcast? Find out as every week I chat with friends old and new that I've met through my career from techie to CMO and share a tune or cocktail and their marketing street knowledge. Just drop a dime into your podcasting jukebox and jive along with Rockstar CMO FM.